You're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick, and this is episode 90, Idol Worship versus Image slash re- uh, rel- Relic Veneration with Dr. Jim Papandrea. Um, before we get into tonight's episode, guys, this is a very important one, I might add. Uh, relic um, Veneration. With Dr. Got Jim. a little bit of an echo here. Um, before we get into tonight's episode, guys, this is a very important one. I might add, uh, relic um, veneration with Dr. Got Jim. a little bit of an echo here. Um, before we get into tonight's episode, guys, this is a very important one. I might add, uh, uh, anything going on your on your end, Jim? It's, it's there might be. Hold on, here. I'm um, working before on. Before we get into tonight's episode, guys, this is a very important one. I might add, uh, anything going on on your end, Jim? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. That was all me. Okay. That's my so, bad. Sorry. You know what? Right. I didn't realize it, but I had I had this show on two different windows in my oh, browser. Oh, okay. That's nice, that nice. Happened. Sorry, okay. everybody. That's the Luddite in the house. <laughs> all good. We are all good. We're off to a running start now. So, yeah. Um, before we get into the content tonight, very important, by the way, because there's been a lot of hullabaloo around this issue lately on the internet so i wanted to address it i wanted to add with uh dr papandrea uh to the conversation this is very important and it's caused a lot of stir so we want to kind of set the record straight and do our part by the grace of god um so just a little bit about my sponsor havana palace on huron church road in windsor ontario for the best service and finest cigars, go see Caesar and Eli. They treat all their customers like family. If y'all would be so kind as to go to facebook.com slash Havana Palace, give that page a like. I would greatly appreciate it. Okay. So we are here to talk about icon and image veneration versus idol worship tonight. Very, yeah. uh, I mean, normally this isn't a huge issue, but for some reason, for some uh, it, reason recently, it's got some traction. It shouldn't be a huge issue. And, you know, before we before we go too much farther, I want to personally thank uh, Michael Lofton and Reason of Theology, because we we had a, a start to this conversation on Wednesday on his show, and that's already out there. So we maybe don't need to say quite everything we already said there. Maybe there'll be some overlap, but we're definitely going to be saying some some more things tonight uh, that didn't get said on Michael's show. And I want to officially add Michael Lofton to my list of YouTubers you can trust. So. Yes, absolutely. Michael <laughs> is enough. a great guy. His channel's excellent. His content is excellent. I encourage everyone to check out Reason and Theology in general, but especially that episode you did with them just the other day. Yeah. Um, I also want to give a shout out to all the people who have been doing videos on this topic recently, including William Albrecht, Swan Sona, um, again, yourself and Michael. And uh, if there's anybody I'm forgetting, I do apologize. Oh, yes, uh, Jimmy Aiken and Trent Horn. So everybody who's done uh, videos on this issue so far, a big shout out to you. Thank you for keeping the conversation lively and going. Um, So, guys, I hope you're ready. So let's dive right in. All right. So a lot of people think, Jim, that Catholics, you know, we bow down to statues. We kiss icons. We're idol worshipers. What is the difference between an idol and an icon, firstly? Well, you know, there are uh, there are two kinds of images. There are icons and there are idols. And the thing that it is really important to understand is that the difference between an icon and an idol has nothing to do with the thing itself. It is all about how it's used or how it's approached. If a thing is worshipped, it is an idol. And that obviously breaks uh, the commandment against Uh, worshiping anything other than God. Um, But there is is a sense in the church, and historically has been from the beginning, that the church has what is variously called holy things or holy objects, things that can be treated as holy. And we're going to talk about examples of these things tonight, but icons are uh, simply one category of holy things, and um, and and again, you know, there is a certain amount of reverence that can be paid toward holy things without crossing a line into into worship, right? And so, so this is 
this is the question we need to talk about because a lot of times when you hear conversation about this, um, it's presented, especially by by those who aren't in the ancient traditions like Catholic and Orthodox and Coptic. If, if someone's not in one of those ancient traditions, it's presented as though any icon is automatically an idol or any image is automatically an idol. But you have to know the difference between an icon and an idol. And um, you know, all of the objection that, uh, that you hear to the veneration of icons, all of it is making the very basic mistake of not knowing the difference between an icon and an idol. And, um, and you know, I hope we'll talk a little bit uh, about early Christian iconography because, you know, one of the things that, um, that is assumed in the argument that it doesn't really get said explicitly, but it's always assumed and that is this, that if, if somehow the early church was really against icons, venerating them or not, or worshiping them or not, if, if, if the early church was really against icons, and if the early church really thought that all icons was a, a form of worship of an image, then there would have been no icons in the early church. And yet the early church is full of icons and full of Christian art and full of holy objects that get treated with reverence and veneration. And so, so this, is, this is the kind of thing we need to sort of flesh out because, you know, as I said on Wednesday, you know, uh, anyone who thinks the early church doesn't have icons has never been in a catacomb, has never been to Rome, right? Um, you know, go to these places and see the early iconography for yourself. So, uh, you know, it's like we were talking earlier and I, I, I used that analogy, I said, you know, uh, to, to go on YouTube and say that the church fathers were against icons and to pull out passages that are really against the worship of idols and to apply that as though they apply to icons, it, it's sort of like, you know, someone who is not a medical doctor making a YouTube video about liver dialysis. And everybody gets all freaked out because they think they need liver dialysis. And the real medical doctors are out there watching the video going, oh, my gosh, this guy doesn't even know the difference between a liver and a kidney. Right. right. So and this is how, you know, those of us who teach this stuff uh, for a living hear, hear it. So, yeah. What it's worth. And I just wanted to give a shout out to MK Vine, who says they are enjoying Monte Cristo while listening to this. Hey, cheers, wow. MK Vine. Very That's nice. beautiful. I'm kind of jealous. I have a, a budget stick right now, but it'll, it'll do the trick. Um, it's a so, low-calorie meal right there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. With some bourbon. Uh, okay. So an idol gym. Um, people often appeal to Exodus, the uh, prohibition against graven images, anything in the heavens above or the earth beneath. But I think what they fail to understand is... An, an engravement image is a euphemism for an ancient Near Eastern pagan deity. So when they're talking about bowing down to these things, they're talking about worshiping these gods. And they had ceremonies, uh, like in Egypt and Mesopotamia, where they would take an idol, they would place it in the temple, they would anoint it, and then it was understood that the deity became that physical object. So they're literally worshiping this image. They're worshiping the materials. They're worshiping uh, the spirit in the materials, the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's important. When we venerate an icon, we're not worshiping the material. Number one, we don't think the person being depicted is a God unless we're talking about Christ. But in the case of saints, they're just saints. They're creatures. We're venerating them and the honor that we give to them passes on to their prototype. The icon or statue is not an end unto itself. That, that's a huge difference. And anybody who collapses that into idolatry is making a huge category mistake. That's right. That's right. And that, you know, that that really is the bottom line of the difference between um, the veneration of an icon and the worship of an idol. The veneration of an icon or a relic is that that holy object is a window into the spiritual realm. It is a means to an end. 
that end being, of course, God and union with the divine. It is only a means to an end. The worship of an idol is to make that idol an end in itself and to believe, as you said, that the God is somehow in that thing. Um, and so, you know, that becomes, that thing becomes the focus of worship. Whereas with the veneration of an, of an icon or a relic, the thing is not the focus of, of worship, but as I say, more like a window into, uh, in, into the divine realm. And so, um, you know, so, so it's, it really is apples and oranges, but again, it really is all about what's in the person's heart. Tertullian himself said this, it's all about what's in the person's heart because, you know, I could, I could worship this glass of amaretto if I want to, that would be wrong, right? If I, if I make that, and I guess, yeah, <laughs> I mean, maybe some people do that. I don't know. But, uh, but you, you know, you get the idea. It's not, it's not the thing itself. So you're right. The, the commandment about graven images has nothing to do with how the image is made. Is it graven or not graven? Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with that. It's, it's all about how it's used. And the proof of that is that the same, you know, right after God tells Moses and the people not to make graven images, he then tells Moses to make a snake on a stick, right? So he turns around and tells him to make an image. This image is an icon until it's worshiped and then it becomes an idol and then it has to be destroyed. So the same image starts out as an icon and becomes an idol because the people crossed a line with it. And yeah. they, for some reason, thought that the power to heal was in the thing and not in the God who uh, it, it that thing. Was reminding them of. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And it's important, too, that it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just a, a statue, but it actually... the. Uh, one who would gaze upon it would actually get healed. So it had a miraculous power because grace was mediated through the bronze serpent. That's right. It had healing power, just like the aprons and veils that touched St. Paul in Acts chapter 19, right? If you've forgotten about that passage, look up Acts 19. What is it? Verses 11 and 12. Um, secondary relics, right? While Paul was even still alive, had healing power. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, there's a reason why I lumped in images and relics in the title. Um, now, there's a thesis running around out there that says, oh, yeah, Christians had art, but there was ab absolutely no veneration of holy things until Second Nicaea. All of a sudden, there's this iconoclast controversy and things just blow up. And then you have these anathemas, you have this council, and all of a sudden... People are venerating holy images. And this was something unheard of, unprecedented, and it's a break with the early church tradition. That's the thesis that's running rampant out there right now. Well, it, it, it can't be proposed by anyone who's actually studied the early church because, because we all know that's absolutely not true. There are really two questions here, right? There's the question of, did the early church have icons? They absolutely did. And we can talk about early Christian art and iconography and relics are a type of icon. Yes. The second question is, you know, did the early church venerate icons? Did they did they show them a kind of reverence that, um, you know, that that is, you know, more than that is shown to, you know, everyday objects? And the answer to that question is also yes. Um and, and, you know, the, the thing is, is that when when the Second Council of Nicaea uh, comes in the 8th century, right, the reason for the controversy is because the emperor had issued an, an edict outlawing icons. So the thing that was new in the 8th century was the opposition to icons. The veneration of icons was a longstanding tradition by this time. What was new was the opposition to icons, and that's what created the controversy. If that emperor had never uh, issued that edict, there would have been no controversy. This was not a controversy raised by bishops who were concerned about theological issues. This was a controversy raised by an emperor who wanted the money and land owned by the monks in the East, uh, you know, who were getting a lot of pilgrims coming to their monasteries to see their beautiful icons. 
Right. So, you know, the new thing was the opposition to icons. It, it, absolutely. Everybody knows that. Yeah. And so you said what you said was key there, Jim. Uh, relics as a type of icon. Because it is the argument of the fathers at Second Nicaea that say this is apostolic tradition. Venerating icons goes back to apostolic times. Now, you might be thinking, I don't recall Peter or Paul or Andrew writing an icon and kissing it and venerating it. No, look at the substance of what they're saying. Relic as a type of icon. Relics have been venerated. And again, they, save this, they, they serve the same purpose, right? They remind us of the saint. They also spur us on to good works in remembrance of the saint. They inspire us to implore their intercession and God may mediate grace and miraculous power and healing through those means, whether it's a relic, whether it's an icon. So the relic veneration has been since apostolic times. And even in the old Testament, you have a dead man being brought to life through contact with the prophet Elisha's bones. So not only is it a part of the deposit of faith, but it goes back to the old covenant, right? And this is key. Because what the, we talk about development of doctrine, it's not as if, you know, you have Christian art for eight centuries with no veneration of any kind, and then you have widespread veneration. That's a rupture. What we have is we have the same truth being expressed. Relics as a type of icon being venerated, getting in contact with a saint, experience God's grace through the saint and their intercession. The only thing that sort of shifts with the icons is the external medium. So whereas before it was a relic, whether it's a piece of a saint or their clothing, now you have the external medium of a statue or icon, but it serves the same purpose. It's to remind us of the saint, to implore their intercession, and God may choose to work miraculous, um, you know, do miraculous things through that icon, through that statue, and bring about healing or sanctification. So that the development is the statuary or the iconography but the veneration of the saint whether the, through the external means of the relic or icon that substantially is the exact same since the apostolic times so there is no substantial rupture in doctrine or practice yeah that's that's right and uh, you know maybe uh, uh, an additional way to say that would be to say that uh, you know we have evidence in the church of the veneration of relics from you know, the earliest documents that aren't, you know, uh, after the New Testament, I mean, second century, we, we already have um, evidence of the veneration of relics, of the belief that relics, not only are relics holy things, but they are a means of grace. And to, to have a relic in a place makes that place holy. So yes. the holiness of a relic makes the place holy. And I mean, I, you know, we could do two hours on that easily. But then what happens is that um, understanding of the way in which relics are a means of grace, the way in which uh, relics are, are, are venerated as holy objects, that gets extended to icons. Right. But also we should emphasize that still happens very early. This, this is not something that just happened, you know, at the end of the seventh century right. or something like that. It still happens very early. And, you know, maybe we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit of the timeline here. Um, but again, this is not a late development. Yeah. And I just want to give a big shout out to um, Eric Ibarra, who released an article today. I think it was today. I, I came up across it today anyway. Um, it's very, it's a very, uh, excellent article and it expresses the same thing which we expressed here and it's funny because that's the direction that i wanted to take it relics as a type of icon and here he comes with the confirmation i believe this is from the holy spirit expressing the very same truth but much more beautifully than i could possibly do um i just want to read uh from a little quote from the couple quotes from his article he says the cultists of relics was also aimed at obtaining the miraculous power of god through the relic as well as making the person to whom the relic came from a certain kind of present an active advocate in the cause of healing, curing, or even mercy and salvation. 
What this shows then is that the relics gave an occasion for those who visited them the opportunity to consciously remember the saint, to pay honor to that saint, and especially to inquire about receiving the intercessory power of that saint. If this is the case, then what distance separating relic veneration and icon veneration exists so far as the saints are concerned? Wonderful yeah. quote. And that's, yeah. that's it. What, what, what is there in terms of how big is the jump between relic and icon veneration if the principle is the same, namely the intercession of the saint? There's no distance. Well, yeah. So two things I want to say about that. First of all, you're right about the principle being the same. But even underneath that, there's a there's a there's an even more foundational principle, which is that God does mediate grace through the material world and through material things. The incarnation itself is proof of that. The other thing I wanted to say too is, in case anyone's tempted to say, "Oh, well, wait a minute," you know, relics are bones and they're not they're not made by humans but yeah. icons are made by humans. Well, that's that's not really true because there are relics that are made by humans in the sense of the clothing of a saint or, you know, or some other exactly. personal item of a saint, something that's touched a saint's body. So there certainly are relics that are man-made. Man -made. Yeah. Um, and so again, you know, if you had like a Venn diagram of, you know, God made holy things and human made holy things. The you know there'd be certain relics that would be in that overlap um, category. And yeah. so again, that just shows you how it flows, uh, you know, from relics into you know into the icons. Into and icons. It, it all becomes again um, a window into uh, the spiritual world, into a window toward union with God. And it's not a one way window because again, God uses these things to grant grace to uh you know to to believers to people exactly um and maybe we can get into some quotes uh about relics i have a couple here uh starting with polycarp which would be the first century he was an apostle of john so he says we worship as this christ we worship as the son of god but the martyrs we love as disciples and imitators of the lord and rightly so because of their unsurpassable devotion to their king and teacher with them, may we also become companions and fellow disciples. Then at last, we took up his, meaning Polycarp's bones, more precious than costly gems and finer than gold, and put them in a suitable place. The Lord will permit us, when we are able, to assemble there in joy and gladness and to celebrate the birthday of his martyrdom, both in memory of those who have already engaged in the contest and for those who practice and, and train of those who have yet to fight. So here we have... Polycarp, a disciple of John, we have his disciples, Polycarp's disciples, gathering his bones, which they view as more precious than gold and fine gems, and they assemble in the place where those relics are to celebrate his birthday, i.e. his martyrdom. That's right. That's right. And of course, you know, the evidence is everywhere in the catacombs um, that the early Christians uh, practiced this tradition of the memorial meal. Um, it is the, is the origin of the Feasts of the Saints. Um, so if we say on a certain day, it's so-and-so, St. So-and-so's feast day, well, that will go all the way back to the early church when people would actually go to the grave site. Or if the saint, if, was, if the martyr was buried in a catacomb, then literally have a picnic uh, on the ground above the catacomb or go into the catacomb and, and have a, a memorial meal and very often a Eucharist. And so... Um, you know, it's it's amazing how in the early church, how often literally the top of a person's sarcophagus served as the Eucharistic table. Yeah. And that is the origin of the idea that, you know, in a church, there's a tomb under the, the main altar and there's a relic in that tomb. And eventually it becomes just the rule that you, you can't consecrate a new church and a new altar without a relic because the relic is what makes the place holy. And so this is all tied together. And again, it, it all comes back to a very important doctrine in Christianity, which is the doctrine of the resurrection, right? We don't believe that our ultimate destiny is to be disembodied spirits. That's a pagan idea, right? We believe in the resurrection at which time our spirits and our transformed and, and glorified and resurrected bodies will be reunited. And the church fathers and the church mothers, by the way, believed uh, that 
there's this eternal connection between each of our spirits and our bodies that uh, never goes away, even when they're separated. So when the relics are here on earth and the soul is in heaven with Christ, you know, how, how can you get closer to God? By being closer to the mortal remains of someone who is close to God, right? That mm. it's, it's that kind of a connection between heaven and earth. And so, um, you know, a, a, again, to, to treat relics and icons and places as holy, to treat physical things as holy, this is a part of our tradition from the beginning. Mm. It just yeah, it just is. And I want to quote, uh, I want to quote from St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Augustine on relics, because the reason, and these quotes are very poignant, because these these writings are coming out at the same time in the golden age of the fathers when is supposedly at the exact time when icons are being rallied against by these same fathers so i just want to show the disconnect uh, and mm -hmm. we're going to show that in a moment with some other uh, so-called anti-iconic quotes uh, but here's from saint gregor of nyssa these spectacles strike the senses and delight the eye by drawing us near to the martyr's tomb which we believe to be both a sanctification and a blessing if anyone takes dust from the martyr's resting place, it is a gift and a deserving treasure. Should a person both have the good fortune and permission to touch the relics, this experience is highly valued prize and seems like a dream to those who were cured and to those whose wish was fulfilled. The body appears as if it were alive and healthy. The eyes, mouth, ears, as well as the other senses are caused for pouring out tears of reverence and emotion. In this way, one implores the martyr who intercedes in our behalf and is an attendant of God for imparting those favors and blessing which the people seek. So, I mean, that's that's pretty, that's, again, that's the two-way street you're talking about. We're not just entreating the martyr's intercession, but the graces of God through that martyr come to us. Those graces are mediated to us and can heal right. us. That's uh, right. So that, yeah. that's from uh, Greg, Greg of Nyssa. St. Augustine, I... I wanted to bring him him up because he he has a beautiful testimony to relics here, but he also makes a crucial distinction, which I want to draw out, which is also important. Uh, we, the Christian community, assemble to celebrate the memory of the martyrs with ritual solemnity because we want to be inspired to follow their example, share in their merits, be helped by their prayers. Yet we erect no altars of any of the martyrs, even in the martyrs' burial chapels themselves. No bishop, when celebrating at an altar where these holy bodies rest, has ever said, Peter, we make this offering to you, or Paul to you, or Cyprian to you. No, what is offered is always offered to God who crowned the martyrs. We offer in the chapels where the bodies of those he crowned rest, so the memories that cling to those places will stir our emotions and encourage us to greater love, both for the martyrs whom we can imitate and for God whose grace enables us to do so. So we venerate the martyrs with the same veneration of love and fellowship that we give to the holy men of God still with us. We sense that the hearts of these latter are just as ready to suffer death for the sake of the gospel, and yet we feel the devo devotion towards those who have already struggled and emerged victorious from the struggle. We honor those who are fighting on the battlefield of this life here below, but we honor more confidently those who have already achieved the victor's crown and live in heaven. But the veneration strictly called worship or latria, that is special homage only belonging to the divinity, is something we give and teach others to give to God alone. So he's echoing what St. Gregory of Nyssa is saying, but he's also, and I've heard this, that the latria dulia distinction doesn't come to later. But here we have St. Augustine in the 400s saying we only, we only offer worship to God, yet we venerate the martyrs. Yeah. That, that's a really important point because, you know, what, what Nicaea II did, the, the Second Council of Nicaea in the year 787, what they did was to um, clarify and standardize the technical terminology for the difference between veneration and worship. It's not that they invented the difference between veneration and worship. Mm. That difference was always known. And I'll, I'll prove it to you in a second. But, but so they didn't create the distinction. They only clarified the technical terminology so that they could affirm what the church already knew, that veneration is acceptable while worship is not, and you know that the one does not equal the other. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, you know the the church suffered a lot of persecution uh, with uh, through waves of persecution. Some some worse, some not as bad. During the worst times of persecution, Christians were either uh, required to make a pagan sacrifice 
or they were rounded up and tortured and tried to, they tried to force Christians to make a pagan sacrifice, right? Every Christian knew what they weren't supposed to do. Now, some of them broke and they did it anyway, but then there was a controversy over whether they could be reconciled to the church. So it's not like they thought, oh, I was only venerating that pagan statue. No, they knew what worship was because worship is not simply bowing to an image. It requires some kind of liturgical act, like an animal sacrifice, sacrifice. or an incense sacrifice, or a libation sacrifice. So these are the things that Christians knew they could not do for an image, and these are the so so the, and these are the things that Christians refuse to do, even at the risk of their own lives. So you know, there's there's no question that the early Christians understood the difference between venerating an icon and worshiping an idol. And the truth is, is that once you separate out the apologetic documents that are criticizing pagan idol worship, and you look at whether Christians were ever criticizing other Christians for any of this stuff, they really weren't that worried about it. Yeah, yeah, and that's a nice segue um, into what I was going to ask you. Um, yeah, let's talk about some uh, aniconic passages that are often used. I'm just going to pull some of those up. And by the way, I encourage everybody to go to um, just to go to Google, type in Eric Ibarra, and type in relic veneration and icon veneration parallel. St. John Chrysostom says yes. So everybody check out that article. It was just released. It's a it's a banger of an article. It's absolutely wonderful. It draws beautiful connections, and he hits the nail on the head and knocks it out of the park. So if you're watching, Eric, or you do watch, big shout out to you, my friend. Thank you for writing that. All right, so let's get into some of these aniconic uh, passages. Sure. These are passages uh, that uh, the opponents of the veneration of icons would will sometimes bring out as though they are supposed to be evidence for church fathers being against the veneration of icons, right? So that's what we're right. saying. Um, and full disclosure, we've talked about some of this ahead of time. So if I sound like I know all this stuff off the top of my head, I have looked up much of it recently just to double check. So <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. So let's start with uh, Clement of St. Clement of Alexandria. Okay. This one, everybody's favorite curmudgeon. Yes. And it's okay to be a curmudgeon. St. Jerome was, and he's still a saint. And uh, it's, it's okay to be, it's okay to have righteous anger sometimes. So. Curmudgeons can be saints. But, you know, Clement of Alexandria, just to say this up front, Clement of Alexandria is the guy who pretty much thinks if you like it, it's a sin, right? So just to put this in context, even if he does gripe about something, in context, he also thinks you should not eat gourmet food drink imported wine no one should wear makeup no no one should braid their hair no one should wear jewelry right so again put it in context he's what we call a rigorist which means he's extremely strict and expects all christians to be as strict as he is so with yes. that in mind context context is key right yep so uh here's here's some from uh, clement here saint clement pray for us uh, now the images and temples constructed by mechanics are made of inert matter so that they too are inert and material and profane. And if you perfect the art, they partake of mechanical coarseness. Works of art cannot then be sacred and divine. Now that's from the Stramata. Yep. And he expands on this idea. Um, he expands on this in the exhortation. Now this is key. In this work, it's called the exhortation to the heathen. Okay. Yeah, it's an apologetic document. Yes, to the heathen, not to the Christian. But here's what right. he says. So powerful is art to delude by seducing amorous men into the pit. Art is powerful, but it cannot deceive reason, nor those who live agreeable to reason. The doves on the picture were represented so to life by the painter's art that the pigeons flew to them, and horses have neighed to well-executed pictures of mares. They say that a girl became enamored of an image and a comely youth of the stature of an image, or sorry, a statue at Sinaitis. But it was the eyes of the spectators that were deceived by art, for no one in his senses ever would have embraced a goddess or entombed himself with the lifeless paramour 
or become enamored with a demon and a stone. But it was with a different kind of spell that art deludes you if it leads you not to the indulgence if it leads you to the indulgence of amorous affections, it leads you to pay religious honor and worship to images and pictures. The picture is like, well and good, let art receive its meed of praise, but let it not deceive man by passing itself off for truth. The horse stands quiet, the dove flutters not, its wing is motionless, but the cow of Daldius, made of wood, that's a, that's a pagan idol, by the way, made of wood, allured the savage bull, and art having deceived him, compelled him to meet a woman full of licentious passion. Such frenzy have mischief-working arts created in the minds of the insatiate. On the other hand, oh, well, I can stop there. But some key points here, right? So first, the work is, so if he says in the stromata, works of art cannot be sacred and divine. You might be thinking, well, what kind of works of art is he referring to? Well, in the exhortation of the heathen, he goes at length and clarifies. He specifically yeah. mentions the name of a pagan daldius or some kind of cow. Some side, and he, he literally mentions the word goddess and yoking yourself into a, into a god or goddess and going into a frenzy and paying religious worship to this image of a pagan god. So clearly, that's what Clement, that's who Clement is, is exhorting and addressing, is a pagan audience, not Christian iconography or statuary. That's right. That's right. He is, um, he is clearly talking about pagan idols. It, it, this is an apologetic work. And, and remember, the apologies, the apologetic works of the early church fathers are all written to pagans. Now, Christians read them too, but they're addressed to pagans as apologetic works defending Christianity. So you will very often get in these apologetic works these uh, these very common themes, which is you pagans are fools for worshiping blocks of wood and stone, right? right? So clearly, you know, this is about... Um, this is about idolatry. It is not about icons. It's not about any Christian context at all. It, it, I love this one, though, because I love the way he talks about how um, about the ability of art to deceive. And so sometimes even animals are fooled by statues. But then he goes on to say, and yet the pigeons crap on them anyway. So yeah, yeah that's <laughs> a good way, that's pigeons a are way to put it. Yeah. Right. But the point, his point is, that it is a delusion to worship idols. And so he's saying to these pagans, don't be fooled by this. Don't be fooled by this. Now, in the Stromata, right, the Stromata, the English translation of that is the, the miscellaneous stuff, miscellaneous. So these are like fragments of just, you know, deep thoughts by Clement of Alexandria, right? So here also he's talking about paganism. He's talking about when he says works of art cannot be sacred and divine, right? What he means is a work of art cannot be a divinity, a god or a goddess. Yes, it's amen. about idols. It's not about icons. In context, the one you mentioned, Stramata 7, 5, um, in that context, he's talking about how ridiculous it is for pagans to try and make a god, right? Yes. Because the creature cannot make the creator. The creator makes the creatures, not the other way around. And the creator is omnipresent everywhere. And the technical term for that is uncircumscribable, right? Cannot be contained. And so he's saying how foolish it is for these pagans to try and circumscribe or contain a deity within a thing, right? When the real deity cannot be contained. So uh, again, this is absolutely not at all about icons. It is about the foolishness of pagans thinking that their deity is is in the thing. Christians don't. Christians have holy things, but we don't think God is in the thing, right? Right. And that's kind of a big, big difference. Also, notice this. So, pagans will, uh, if they build a temple, they will put the statue of their deity front and center, like as you walk in, although you didn't always walk in, but if you walked in, the, um, you know, the statue would be down the center aisle, front and center, right there at the point of focus, right? Christians never put statues there, right? Um, so, it, you know, it, it's not, uh, it's not the same thing. Apples and oranges, you know, uh, yeah. it's, it's not what he's talking about. 
Yeah, very good clarification because I've seen I've seen that one quote mine and that last portion works of art cannot be sacred and divine. What's an icon? What's an icon? What's a statue? It's a work of art. Therefore, it can't be sacred. What are you doing, Catholics? What are you doing, Orthodox? Right, right. You well, know? You know, here's the other problem, right? When they proof text these passages, they're usually working with English translations and archaic ones at that, right? So, um, you know, if somebody throws at you works of art cannot be sacred and divine, you got to say, what do you mean by sacred? What do you mean by divine? What's the Greek word there behind that English translation, right? Because, you know, and, and never forget this. I mean, I have the, the series right here. Those translations were done by Protestants who right. had a vested interest in downplaying the, you know, Catholic aspects of the early church, right? And right. so they're translating these things with a Protestant bias. So you got to look at if you you know you you have to either look at the original language yourself, or you know have somebody you can trust who can, and read it in context. And I, I've got a whole video on how you cannot proof text the church fathers because you know for all these reasons you have to read it in context. You have to know the original language. You have to be able and 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 also you have to have spent enough time reading broadly in the church fathers to know what the consensus is so that if there is an outlier right then you at least know that 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 outlier does not speak for the consensus so far we haven't found an outlier so far you know all of these uh passages are um you know talking about idol worship not about icons uh but if we do find outliers and you know we we were uh, when we were talking with michael uh we we talked a little bit about that epiphanius passage and I said, yeah, okay, maybe maybe Epiphanius is an outlier, but look at what he says. He says, I opposed this icon, and everybody hates me for it. So he's clearly in the minority, right? Right, right. And so, you know, for Clement though, it's funny because he's got he's got a passage where he says, and this contextualizes what he was saying elsewhere nicely, or draws a distinction. He says, and let our seals be either a dove or a fish. And a dove, by the way, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. Uh, a dove or a fish or a, sh a ship scuttling before the wind or a musical lyre which Polycrates used or a ship's anchor which Seleucus got engraved as a device. And if there be one fishing, he will remember the apostle and the children drawn out of the water. For we are not to delineate the faces of idols. There it is. There's a distinction. He says, we have our sacred we have our sacred seals, and they remind us of the apostles, the children drawn out of the water, but we are not to carve faces of idols. So there it is, that distinction between pagan and Christian usage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he's talking about symbols, and and he mentions the dove and the ship and the anchor and the fishermen. And, and you know, if you go into the catacombs in Rome, what are you going to see? A dove, a, an anchor, a ship, a fisherman. You know, oh, these are all the early Christian symbols. Um you know, he, again, though, Clement of Alexandria is probably going to be one of those church fathers who is going to be a little bit more skeptical of fancy things, right? Yeah. Not necessarily because they're examples of idolatry, but more because they're examples of, you know, they're indulgent and, and extravagance, yeah. right? So, so he likes his symbols. Um, he's not going to be a big fan of what we would call art. But again, it's, it's not right. that he, it's idolatry. It's just that he thinks it's too fancy. Yeah, he thought a lot of things were too fancy, right? So exactly. it, it would only make sense uh, given his character. So that was that was Clement. Uh, why don't we do? Let's talk about T Tertullian for a moment. Now he's not he's an he's an ecclesiastical writer, and he ended up being a, her a Montanist heretic. But still, well, you know, I I I'd want to nuance that. Um, you know, the latest scholarship on Montanism is that it's it's not really a heresy per se. Um, it's, we don't even really have evidence that it was schismatic, at least not for Tertullian. Um, in Tertullian's case, the Montanists in North Africa were really more like what you would call a charismatic renewal movement within the church. Mm. In some places in the East, the Montanists also became modalists right? Mm, okay. um, which made them heretics for the modalist heresy. But Tertullian can't be a modalist because he wrote against Praxius and Praxius was a modalist. So Tertullian is absolutely against modalism. So I think it's, I actually do consider Tertullian 
a church father. He's what I would consider a lay catechist. He's also a curmudgeon. He's also a rigorist. He has lots of beefs with the pope, with the popes, the bishops of Rome. So he's not perfect. Um, but at any rate, we can uh, yeah we can talk about. It. Yeah, let's read let's read some of Tertullian. Uh, likewise, when forbidding the similitude to be made of all things which are in heaven and in earth and in the waters, he declared also the reasons as being prohibitory of all material exhibition as a latent idolatry. For he adds, thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them. The form, the form, however, of the brazen serpent, which the Lord afterwards commanded Moses to make, afforded no pretext for idolatry, but was meant to cure those who were plagued with the fiery serpents. I say nothing of what was figured by this cure. Thus, too, the golden cherubim and seraphim were pur purely an ornament in the figured fashion of the ark, adapted to ornamentations for reasons totally remote from all conditions of idolatry, on account of which the making of a likeness is prohibited, and they are evidently not at variance with this law of prohibition because they are not found in that form of similitude and reference to which the prohibition is given. So he's talking about, you know, making things and then he makes an exception for the bronze serpent and the cherubim because they're ornamentary so they give no pretext for idolatry yeah yeah well i mean and and yet the bronze serpent did give a pretext for idolatry yeah, it, it actually did that's right it turned into an idol yeah i gotta say i i'm always surprised when people bring this one out as a supposed passage against icons because I actually think this is a pro-icon passage. If you read it in context, here's what Tertullian is saying, right? The bronze serpent and the seraphim over the ark are not idols because they weren't worshipped. They're certainly not images of pagan deities. I mean, obviously, right. no matter no matter what you do with it, you should never make an image of a pagan deity, right? I mean, yeah. like you wouldn't say oh well i have this little statue of isis but i don't worship it no get that out of your house you don't want that yeah. right but but the point is, is that tertullian is actually demonstrating that he knows the difference between an icon and an idol and he goes on to say that what matters is what's in your heart and how you approach it right and so the thing that makes something uh, uh, you know an idol is that you're worshiping it in your heart, don't do that, right? But there are things yeah. we can have that are symbols, that are representations, um, that are icons, that you know can be holy things if your heart toward them is right. That's really what he's saying. Yeah, and not worshiping them. And obviously, right. uh, like St. Augustine made that distinction with the relics. He said, we venerate them, we don't worship them as God. Well, the same would apply to what Tertullian is saying here. That's right. And, you know, there's there's an interesting um, line in Nicaea 2, and um, I'm drawing a blank on it now, but if I can find it here, uh, let's see here. Yeah. Um, so in Nicaea 2, when they clarify the language around uh, veneration versus worship, um, it, it says, for the honor which is paid to the image passes on to that which the image represents. That's basically quoting Tertullian, because that's what Tertullian is saying in that passage, that the honor paid to the bronze serpent passes through it to the God whom it represents, right? That's Tertullian. Well, the fathers at Nicaea too are basically quoting Tertullian as, as a way to help them define the distinction between veneration and worship. Mm. Yeah, so that's a, that's actually an illuminating passage from Tertullian contra what some people might make it out to be, right? Yeah, yeah. but you got to read it in context, and that's why you can't proof text the church fathers. Right, and everybody should go watch your video on uh, on your channel, uh, same should. title, right? Yeah. Check that out for sure. Uh, all right, let's talk about Irenaeus for a second, because Irenaeus mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is an interesting case, right? Disciple of Polycarp, who is a disciple of John. So yeah. we have that apostolic connection. Apostolic tradition is very strong in Irenaeus. All right. So he says, others of them employ outward marks, branding their disciples inside the lobe of the right ear. I think he's talking about a group of Gnostics here. From among these yeah. also arose Marcelina, who came from Rome, of the Episcopate of Anicetus, and holding these doctrines, she led astray multitudes. They themselves, they style themselves Gnostics. Now here's, here's the interesting part here, Jim. 
They also possess images, some of them painted and others formed from different kinds of material, while they maintain that a likeness of Christ was made by Pilate at the time when Jesus lived among them. They crown these images and set them up along with the images of the philosophers of the world, that is to say, the images of Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle and the rest. They also have other modes of honoring, honoring, honoring rather, these images after the same manner of the Gentiles. And so right off the bat, boom, I'm thinking, okay, these Gnostics have statues of, a statue of Jesus, which they claim was made by Pilate. They treat it like the, the Gentiles do these statues. They crown them. They honor them. This is wrong. But... Well, yeah, let me just, just let's notice the, the last phrase there, right? They have statues, they honor them, they crown them. And then he says, correct me if I get this, if I don't get this exactly right, because I don't have it in front of me. But, but then he says, and they also treat them the way the Gentiles, Gentiles treat do. their statues, right? Which so worship them as deities. It's like everything he says before the also is not the point. It's after right. also they and and but here's the problem: they also treat them the way the pagans treat their statues. In other words, they are crossing the line and they are worshiping these statues as deities. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it is really interesting this 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 idea of a statue of Jesus because um, there was also another legend in the early church that uh, there's a story that the emperor Tiberius was thinking about making a statue of Jesus and putting it up in the Pantheon in Rome. Now, in case you don't know, the Pantheon was at the time a pagan temple. It's since been converted into a church, but at the time it was a pagan temple, Pantheon, all the gods. It was a temple dedicated to all the pagan gods with statues of many of them in there around a circle. So the story was, and I don't think it's true, but the story was that the emperor Tiberius, a pagan emperor, was going to make a statue of, uh, or commission a statue of Jesus and put it up in the pantheon with all the other gods as if Jesus was one of the gods. This is exactly how the Gnostics treated Jesus, one right. of the two gods, right? Now, but, but the interesting thing about that, though, is that the early Christians seem to think, wow, if he did that, that would be really cool. <laughs> they don't seem to criticize it <laughs> like you sort of want them to. Um, but uh, it, I'm I'm 100 sure it never happened. I don't think there was ever a statue of Jesus in the pantheon. Yeah, but I doubt again, it. Then, it seems like some of the early Christians liked the idea, like they're like like our guy was gonna you know get in there, like that was gonna be one step on the road to converting the empire or something. Uh, right. Anyway. but anyway, I think the point of the passage in Irenaeus is you know this is against heresies, and yeah. in the document against heresies, which by the way is very very long. In the document against heresies, Irenaeus goes through all of the different Gnostic sects, S-E-C-T-S. I can't say that word without it sounding like sex. So Irenaeus' document is about safe sex, right? Yeah, um, safe. Yeah, the one safe yeah. sex. Yeah. Um, oh, he goes through all the different Gnostic schools of thought and, um, and explains what they teach and who their leaders are. And, uh, you know, people used to say, oh, you know, he's just making this stuff up or he's not being fair to them. And then we found Gnostic documents and, and scholars are like, holy cow, Irenaeus is actually pretty accurate. He knows yeah. what he's talking about. Yeah, so exactly. The thing, though, is he's criticizing because the Gnostics would claim to be Christians. The Gnostics would claim to be the best Christians. And Irenaeus is saying, no, these are just pagans who came into the church but didn't let go of their paganism and they're still practicing polytheism. So he's calling them out for this. Um, so it doesn't matter if you have a statue of Jesus. Um, if you, if you worship it along with statues of all a bunch of other gods, you got a problem, right? Exactly. So, Thank yeah. you for saying that because yeah. here's the thing. Again, you read this on face in the, in the, and the individual or individuals who proof texted Irenaeus and they pulled this out and said, oh, look, they have a statue of Jesus. They crown it. They treat it after the men or the Gentiles. Boom, full stop. But what they don't tell you is, number one, this is a Gnostic sect. Uh, or they might they might just say it is a Gnostic sect called the Carpocratians. But what's key here, I think, is it says um, they crown these images and they set them up along with the images of the philosophers. So it's not the statue that's the problem. It's Gnostic syncretism. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Gnostics took every theological and philosophical word they could grab out of the Bible and, and other texts, and they turned that into a deity. So there's a God named Jesus, but there's also a God named Sophia, and there's a God named Grace, and there's a God named, you know, so like every possible concept becomes a God. It's, you know, it's, it's sort of Platonism on steroids or something. I, I don't know, but it's, but it's syncretistic, meaning they just gather up everything they can. They worshiped angels as well. So every possible angel they worshiped as well. So, you know, that's really what's going on there. Yeah. Very nice clarification. So see, people treat that as, oh, Irenaeus knew the apostolic tradition. He's in line with the apostles, the successor of an apostle against statues. Stop it. That's that's what the uh, that's what the pretext was. Right. When you look at it deeper, you say, no, it's it's a lot. There's a lot more going on there than that. So right. we needed right. to clarify that passage. Uh, let's let's look at some others. So we did. We took we talked about uh, Clement. We talked about Tertullian. We talked about Irenaeus. I wanted to talk about um, two more. One's not really used as anti-icon, but it's anti-veneration. But we'll get to him in a minute. I, I wanted to deal with one more uh, really explicit, supposedly aniconic passage. Um, okay, so this is Lactantius of Numidia. God is greater than man, therefore he is above and not below. Nor is he to be to, uh, sought. Nor is he to be sought in the lowest, but rather in the highest region. Wherefore, it is undoubted that there is no religion wherever there is an image. For if religion consists of divine things, and there is nothing divine except in heavenly things, it follows that images are without religion, because there can be nothing heavenly in that which is made from the earth. And this indeed may be plain to a wise man from the very name. For whatever is an imitation, that must of necessity be false nor can anything receive the name of a true object which counterfeits the truth by deception and imitation so basically saying true religion is anti-image so lactantius is kind of a i don't know uh yeah. well, maybe an outlier but he says he says here uh just to drive it home but if all imitation is not particularly a serious matter but if as it were a sport and jest then there is no religion in Im images, but a mimicry of religion. That which is true, therefore, is to, to be preferred to all things which are false, earthly things, or to be trampled upon, that we may attain heavenly things. So basically, yeah, um, images make a mockery of true religion. True religion is anti-image. That's the sense we get from Lactantius. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me say a couple of things about that. I really think that this there's, there's a translation issue going on here. And... Um, you know, I, I, I want to go back and check the original, but I'm pretty sure that the word image there should be translated idol. So in other words, he is speaking about idols. Where there is idols, where there's an idol, it can't be true religion because true religion, again, does not try to circumscribe a deity within a thing, right? So, you know, when as you read that, uh, as you read that passage, I'm convinced that you should replace the word idol, you know, for the word image uh, every time you read it. Um, and so, you know, images should not be treated as divine, which means they shouldn't be worshipped. Um, now, have, oh, and I should say another thing about Lactantius, you know, he's, he comes from the court of Constantine, uh, you know, and he, uh, the court of Constantine can lean Aryan sometimes. So I, I don't know if there's an Aryan influence here. Um, but having with, with those two caveats, you know, yeah, I I would be willing to concede that Lactantius is another outlier because um he does, even if he's talking about idols and not icons, he does seem to be opposed to the very idea of holy things, right? Mm. And so um you know, like Epiphanius, this could be our one other outlier. I, you know, like at the end of the day, I'm going to admit could two, two yeah. outliers, Epiphanius and Lactantius, but they do not speak for the consensus of the church fathers. They are uh, a very small minority. Um, and uh, because we, you know, we can see 
the acceptance of the idea of holy things in many other places. And, you know, the, again, this gets back to the idea that if you're going to try to mine the church fathers for what the church fathers taught, as in what is the tradition of the church, you have to have read enough of the church fathers to know where uh, a quote falls within the consensus or where a quote is opposing the consensus. And Epiphanius and Lactantius in these cases would be going against the grain of the consensus of the early church. So they are literally the exceptions that prove the rule. Right. So there's yeah. a possibility that Lactantius might not be an outlier, but then we could also concede it. Now, and the reason why he may not be is the reason you gave uh, if you replace the word image with idol. And that's exactly what the Bible means by, by image, right? It's talking of graven image, i.e. idol. So the same thing might be happening in Lactantius here, in which case he wouldn't be an outlier because he would be speaking to pagan deities. But he could, let's just concede, he could be. And that's fine because St. Thomas Aquinas, for as great as he is, he's the doctor of the church, the angelic doctor, he didn't believe in the Immaculate Conception, but we don't go by his opinion. He's an outlier in that respect. Right. Church fathers can be wrong. That's why it's it's all about consensus. And so I would want to check two things. If I was really going to you know, go down this rabbit hole, I'd want to check two things. First, I would want to check the original text, the Latin of Lactantius, and see what word, what Latin word there is being used for image or idol. Having said that, though, it is not the case that the same word in Latin or Greek always gets translated into the same word in English, right? It, it, that also depends on context, right? Right. Um, the other thing I'd want to check is, I'd, I'd want to check the date on this document because at least one of Lactantius's documents, uh, he wrote very early in his Christian life because he converted. So I want to see, like, how long has he been a Christian when he wrote this, you know? So these are things you'd have to, you know, check into. But again, if it turns out he's an outlier, okay, uh, but he's still, you know, he's still one of two. Yeah, exactly. If, and that's that's an if, right? That is, um, that, is a big, that is a big if, yeah. And so those who might not be familiar with the Ep Epiphanius case, Epiphanius of Salamis is writing to the bishop of Jerusalem, John, and he says, I, went, I, saw, um, I saw a light outside of a, I don't know, like a, a house type of structure. He went in, he knew, he knew it was a church, but then he saw... There was a curtain with an image of either a saint or Christ. He didn't recall which, but he said he got so incensed that he tore it down and he told he told the people, give this to somebody to use as a tunic. And he said, I'll commission to have a proper one made. Now, that to me seems like, well, two things, right? He's clearly an outlier if that is truly attributed to him, number one. Yeah. Um, and number two, he said certain persons have come against me. So yeah. he's saying that other people have chastised me for this. So he's clearly in the minority if that is right. in fact authentic Epiphanius. Right, right, because it's the last paragraph in a, in a letter where he makes excuses for all the things people hate him for, right? So the <laughs> last thing on the list of things people hate him for is he destroyed an icon. <laughs> right, so one in a long list, right? Yeah. Um, so he might be an outlier, uh, but that's the, that's not the consensus. Um, right. And I, I do want to bring up one more that, again, is not an iconic, but he's used for a reason for polemical purposes, and we'll get into that in a second. So St. Gregory the Great, furthermore, we notify you that it has come to our ears that your fraternity, seeing certain adorers of images, broke and threw down these same images in churches. And we com we indeed commend you for your zeal against anything made with hands being an object of adoration. Interesting, it's talking about the worship of images, to not the veneration, right? Yeah, adoration uh, means worship. Worship. But yeah. we signify to you that you ought not to have broken these images, for pictorial representation is made use of in church for this reason that such as are ignorant of letters may at least read by looking at the walls which they cannot read in books. Your fraternity, therefore, should have both preserved the images and prohibited the people from adoration to them to the end that both those who are ignorant of the letters might have wherewith to gather a knowledge of the history and that the people by no means would sin by adoration of a pictorial representation. So 
the polemic apologetic for St. Gregory the Great here is, yeah, images can be used in churches, but they're to teach, they're, they're didactive, they're to, te to teach illiterate people the gospel, but don't you dare work, but he, he doesn't say don't you dare venerate them, he says don't worship them. Right, right. And, and, you know, this, yes, this is the passage that is the origin of the idea that, you know, that, that, that art or icons or, or whatever are, you know, the poor man's Bible, like that people are going to learn from these images. But Gregory is making this up on the spot. No one really thought that before him. They're not didactic. Uh, I, uh, Christian art, iconography, symbols, uh, they're not educational because for the most part, what you're looking at is a portrait or just a vignette, right? So right. even if the name of the person is on the portrait, that doesn't tell you anything about them. So they're, they're reminders. They are a remembrance. They're, they're uh, for edification, especially in the catacombs, they're for um, encouragement to give hope and peace about a lost loved one. But they, they only... They only tell you what you already know, right? It's a little vignette or a picture of the stuff you already know. So yes, Gregory says that, but that's not really a thing. The, the, but this is so interesting to me that anyone should use this in any way against icons because he specifically says you should not have destroyed those icons, right? He says, okay, you know, maybe some people did cross the line. Maybe some people went too far and started worshiping these icons out of ignorance. But you should not have destroyed the icons. The problem is not with the icon. The problem is with you because you have not taught them how to appropriately approach the icons. And so Gregory says, look, instead of destroying the icons, teach your people. Teach them how to, how to appropriately uh, uh, approach the icons and not worship them. And when you do that, then everything will be fine. That's Gregory's point. Right. Yeah. Um, let's... And, and, yeah, to, and to reiterate, adore yeah. here means worship. Worship. Right? So yeah. if you if you read in English, someone is adoring something, and that's bad. Well, it's because adore means worship, and we know this because you know read read the stuff uh, around the debate about whether or not the Holy Spirit should be worshipped, and in those old English translations, you know the question is always posed: Is the Holy Spirit adorable? Right, because in other words. Is it legitimate to worship the Holy Spirit? Of course, the answer is yes. But the ironic part there is that it took the church longer to figure out that it's legitimate to worship the Holy Spirit than it did, than it took the church to develop veneration to icons. Right. You know, right. With, with, with no controversy over it until the eighth century. The eighth century. Yeah. Now, I want to get into a couple. Of, okay, number one. So let's say we're running with the thesis that. Uh, icon or image veneration is is late okay here we have a passage from saint john chrysostom talking about saint Meletius. now this one struck me because saint john is writing in the fourth and fifth century he says and what happened was an education in piety for since they were perpetually compelled to have that name meaning saint Meletius, in mind and to have that holy man in their heart they had that name as a repellent for every irrational feeling and thought. And it became so frequent that his name echoed around from every direction, everywhere, both in side streets and in the marketplace and in fields and in highways. But you don't experience so much at the name, but even at the depiction of his body, at least what you did with names, this you practice too in the case of that man's image. For truly, many have carved that holy image on finger rings and on seals and on cups and on bedroom walls and all over the place so that one didn't just hear that holy name but also saw the depiction of his body all over the place and had a double consolation for his loss yeah hmm, making images of saint meletius and this is saint john chrysostom again fourth and fifth century talking about his image being everywhere to be a benefit to believers yeah. Well, again, you know, go in the catacombs, you'll see images of Peter and Paul from centuries before that. Right. Um, right. The, you know, Im the Im images of Peter and Paul are um, are in inscriptions in the catacombs. They are on um, glass utensils, uh, plates like glass. Um, well, I guess probably for communion plates, uh, 
from you know from before this time there you know you get christian symbols on rings and on jewelry um and on on cups and chalices and you know uh, i mean uh what is it um eusebius talks about he knew where they kept the the throne of james right in other words the the Episcopal throne, the, the seat, the preaching chair, because they, back in the day they preached sitting, the preaching chair of James, the first bishop of Jerusalem. And he knew that they, where they had that and where they treated that with reverence, right? Um, I mean, yeah, so you've got, I mean, I've seen portraits of the apostles in the catacombs that go back at least to the fourth century. By the way, um, one of the oldest ones is in the catacomb of St. Priscilla in Rome, is the very first um, painting of of Mary and baby Jesus, the Madonna and child. Um, and that goes back probably to the late second century, maybe early third century. So, you know, I mean, paintings of saints, apostles, Jesus, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah. I just wanted to bring up a couple more from St. Gregory of Tours, who was writing or who lived between uh, 538 and 594, who was Bishop of Tours in France in the year 574, he's got a work called The Glory of the Martyrs. So he brings up a couple of examples. One is um, the woman who supposedly erected a statue of Jesus, or it was the woman who was healed of the flow of blood. Supposedly yeah. she erected a statue of Jesus. Gregory, Although Eusebius has some things to say about it, at least Gregory of Tours looks on it in a favorable light. Um, so that you he, he mentions that you, you see it says he saw it with his own eyes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and there is a story too, that he recounts about an image of Christ being in a church. Um, and he says, for even now at this time, Christ is cherished with such love through a perfect faith that believers who remember his law and the tablets of their, uh, the tablets of their heart also hang a painted image of him in churches and houses to record his power in visible tablets. So that's not, it's not a mere remembrance by looking at Christ. Now there is actual power in that image. So that's interesting. And so the story goes that uh, somebody stole this panel or this painting uh, from the church. He stabbed it. It, it. it bled blood. And the Christians recovered it and hung it back in the church. So that's Gregory of Tours writing in the 500s. So I just wanted yeah. to bring that up. Yeah, too. that's right. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there, there's there's. There's different ways of talking about this. And so sometimes semantics can get in the way. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about the power being in the thing. I think it's more, I mean, it's, you know, they do say that sometimes, but it's more accurate theologically to say that, that they, these are means of grace and they right. meet God's grace through the thing. Um, but that is, that is an important aspect of, uh, you know, ancient Christianity, which is, you know, because we believe in the incarnation and in the doctrine of the resurrection, we do believe that God mediates grace through the physical and through the material world and through holy things. And so, you know, you can see this uh, throughout the, the way um, the early Christians have holy things and the way those holy things make the place where they're kept holy. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's one other sticking point that I can think of off the top of my head uh, that we haven't covered yet, and that is the Synod of Elvira. Um, people bring this up a lot. Uh, fourth, fourth century, around 306, 307. Um, yeah, we, you know what, we don't actually know for sure. Um, I usually say 305, 306. So we'll split the difference and say 306. But but here's the problem, right? The original, uh, you know, documents of the, uh, of the Synod of Elvira don't survive. And so what we have are later copies with what most scholars agree are later additions to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, go ahead and say what you were going to say, but, uh, but keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it, it, Canon 36 is strange because it, it's sort of, there's no, there's no antecedent or following context to this passage. It's just kind of like out of the blue. 
It says, yeah. let no image be painted in churches that what is uh, what is worshipped might not be painted on walls. And people look at that and say, ah. But as you said, most scholars agree. And let me get more specific. If they, uh, they go to William Albrecht's channel, he's got a video. Um, or it might be on Sam Shamoon's channel. Um, and he's got a, he does an interview with uh, William Albrecht and Syriac Orthodox Deacon Daniel Kakish, or Orthodox Subdeacon Daniel Kakish. And William was talking because he, he's, he's fluent in Spanish and German. So he scoured most of the stuff on Elvira that is in Spanish and German. Not a lot of it's done in English. And he actually played a clip. Uh, where he was talking with one of the top Spanish scholars on Elvira that actually wrote a book on it. And he was translating the dialogue for the rest of us who can't speak Spanish between the two of them. And he said, the scholar on the Spanish scholar on, on Elvira said, Canons 20 or 21, I can't remember which, 20 at least through 36 are spurious. Yeah. And that's a top yeah. scholar on Elvira. Yeah. And I think, I think the proof of that is right there in Canon 36 because it mentions churches, right? There are no right? standing churches at right. this time. Where, where are these multiple churches in Spain in 305, 306, before, before the legalization of Christianity? Exactly. There wouldn't be any churches, like there above wouldn't. ground churches. No, and, and even if you were to argue, well, it, it, it's referring to house churches, nobody's calling it that yet, though, right? I mean, it's... I mean, it, 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 it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't ring true for the time. Now, other people will argue that even if Canon 36 is authentic to the Council of Elvira, well, then you could argue that because then it would still be during a time of persecution or at least, uh, yeah, so Christianity is illegal. So if you have a house that's being used as a church, don't paint icons in it because then people will know where to find the Christians when when they come to kick down your door and arrest you all. Right? Exactly. So that's, another way, that's another way of looking at it. So that the the prohibition could be a uh, precautionary thing, you know, during a time of persecution. Because remember, Elvira is not an ecumenical council; it is a local right. regional synod binding only on that part of Spain. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that context because there's another canon that says uh, basically woe to those who um, scandalize the church with graffiti. So it might be talking about, you know, pagans are looking for Christians. You've got an above ground worship space. You see images painted on the walls. You know what it is. You're going to go then deface the sacred thing and do your own stuff over top of it. So it warns against that too. Why would that be right? If that, I, I don't know. That's, that's a good one. I, you know, I mean, Graffiti, believe it or not, is a long-standing Christian tradition. <laughs> so, again, you know, go in the catacombs, and you will see, you know, ancient graffiti from the, you know, third century, second century, and you know, people have scratched in the wall things like Peter and Paul pray for me, Mary pray for us. So, I mean, that right there is proof of the intercession of the saints in the, you know, in the early church, um, and and some of that graffiti is still there. So. So yeah, for so for Elvira, there might be two scenarios. It might be the canon might be spurious, along with several others, and two, even if it's real, there might be a deeper contextual reason why it's there, and it's specific yeah. to that time and place for a particular reason, namely protection against pagan attackers. Right. So that could very well be the case. Yeah, it's you know it's hard to know for sure, but at the end of the day, um, you know it 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 also doesn't speak for the consensus right. of the of the overall early church either way right um did you have anything else that you wanted to add uh you mean on the subject of the uh these these patristic passages i think we've um i think we've covered all the ones that i wanted to cover um some of the main ones that I've seen used in kind of quote mine and proof texted, we've given a context to all of them and concluded that the only outliers might be, might be Epiphanius and Lactantius, but they don't, at, they don't speak most. for the consensus. Yeah. At most, uh, at most we have those two. And, um, and, you know, it's just unfortunate that uh, people who, you know, don't really know how to read the church fathers you know, come up with these long lists of passages that are supposed to be about 
icons when in fact they're not. And then unfortunately people get confused by that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so um, glad that know, we... Another, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Another, uh, you know, interesting passage that I found is this Victricius of Rouen. Um, this is around the turn of the 5th century, end of the 4th century. And he wrote this. He said, I touch remnants, but I affirm that in these relics, perfect grace and perfect virtue are contained. He who cures lives. He who lives is present in his relics. There is nothing fragile in them, nothing that decreases, nothing which can feel the passage of time. They are extraordinary signs of eternity, right? Mm. So again, the idea that holy things could be uh, can can mediate God's grace, and that uh, you know that that veneration of relics very early on becomes extended to to icons. Yeah, and that is what the, that's the key takeaway from tonight, is you know the fathers at Nicaea too are saying. This is the apostolic orthodox faith. So what was already in the deposit of faith, the veneration of relics, which was actually going back to the Old Testament. So it's already there in the, in the substance of the apostolic faith in the form of veneration of relics, which we might say are a type of icon. They're a holy thing, yeah. right? What's, yeah. what, it, what the development is versus a rupture in doctrine is exactly what you said the reverence and the grace gets extended from relics to icons That's but they right. still the relics and icons say, serve the same purpose they act as sort of a stand-in for the saint um, they mediate grace by god's grace through that saint's intercession and it's the exact same idea yeah so that's what yeah. that's the key takeaway that's right and so it you know the the veneration of icons that is affirmed at Nicaea too is not a reversal from earlier tradition, right? It is, it's only affirming the earlier tradition against the more recent opposition to it, right? That's what's going on at Nicaea too. that and clarifying the technical terms for, for veneration versus worship, for sure. you know, but, but I think what's really going on here for, you know, for some, today who are opposed to the very idea of the veneration of icons is that they are opposed to the very idea of development within the life of the church. And so, you know, there, there seems to be in, in uh, you know, in some people, an opposition to any and all development. And so, um, you know, then, then that somehow becomes a problem or, you know, there's there's an opposition to what someone might call late development, but then you've got to ask, like, where are you going to draw the line? How late, um, how late can something develop before it's before it's not legitimate? I mean, which is so ironic because, you know, most of the folks who would be calling the veneration of icons a late development, most of them build their whole religious system on later developments. Right. Uh, like, yeah. you know, things that came out of the Protestant Reformation, like, you know, uh, all sin is equal in the eyes of God. Uh, sola Scriptura, you know, once saved, always saved. Um, the, the rapture, the idea that the Eucharist is only a symbol. All of these things are much later developments than the veneration of icons. So it just seems so ironic to me that that people who believe in those things, which are truly corruptions, right, are, are somehow, you know, looking back and criticizing the veneration of icons, which came along much earlier and was a legitimate development. So, yeah. You know, and that it, development it's, is, a, it's a very small one. It's just a yeah. jump from relics to icons. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's the same view. It's the same graces. Right. So right. it's not even a big development. It's right. much less a rupture. It's a, it's a small development. It's, it's just a different external media, but it stands in for the same thing. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a natural development. Um, and, uh, and as I said, it, as a development, it occurred earlier and more easily and more smoothly than the clarification of the divinity of the Holy Spirit, for example. So yeah, that's true. You know, if you if you're Trinitarian, right? Okay, good. You should be, but you know, you can't you can't call out the veneration of icons as late 
you know, you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to close, I want to close with a quote from uh, Eric Ibar's article, which sums this up very, very nicely and succinctly. He says in relic veneration and icon veneration, that article I was referencing earlier, he says, moreover, since the relic veneration of early centuries already holds the substance of what exists in the veneration of images, there it is. Since the latter is simply a physical depiction of what relic venerators did with mental imagination, if not depiction, it seems to me that there isn't much grounding the, to the claim that the Second Council of Nicaea is a doctrinal U-turn, or as you said, Jim, a reversal from the unanimous consensus of the church fathers in early centuries. Bam. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's 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 not a U-turn at all, and that's I think what what some folks are trying to prove by pulling out these passages from the from the church fathers. But again, they're they're using them you know completely incorrectly and out of context. Um, I also want to be clear too. You know, when I when I mention the Holy Spirit, I am not trying to imply that that the divinity of the Holy Spirit is a development that was there from the beginning. Yeah. Um, but the but the clarification of it and uh, for those of you who know your history, the addition of that third paragraph of the Nicene Creed that that clarifies um, the church's pneumatology, right? Well, that didn't come until the late fourth century, as you know. So uh, it's not that the doctrine of the Trinity is a development, but the clarification of it took some time, right? Yes. Um, yes. And so, you know, when we, you know, we look at the history of the church, you've got to be able to see the big picture. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I'm glad that uh, that I brought you on to give us that big picture. I'm glad that we didn't just speak in generalities. I'm glad that we went into the meat and the nitty gritty and took extensive quotes and scrutinized them and put them in their proper context. And again, you are somebody with a PhD in patristics. You know what you're talking about. You're not a YouTube scholar. You're not just a pop apologist. You know your stuff. So I wanted to bring you on to clarify some of this stuff. And again, I wanted to uh, extend recognition to all those who are um, following in the same vein, uh, namely Eric Ibarra, Michael Lofton, um, Elijah Yassi, uh, William Albrecht, and Swan Sona. If I forgot anybody, I do apologize. Hopefully now you can add us to the list, guys. If you have any confusion over this issue, if you know anybody who's been confused and scandalized by recent videos by a certain individual, then please share this video, like this video, subscribe to this channel, and also subscribe to G uh, Jim's channel. Jim, why don't you tell us a bit about the work that you're doing in the YouTube channel that you have going on and what purpose it serves? Yeah, you bet. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, I, I am a professor, so I, I, I am not on YouTube full time. I'm not one of those guys, um, but I do have a YouTube channel. The handle is The Original Church. And, um, you know, I started this YouTube series to sort of uh, you know teach people about how uh, original Christianity is Catholic Christianity, it is ancient Christianity. Um, I, you know, I put the Orthodox and the Coptics in there too. That's fine, um, but the point is, is that you know there's there's this myth out there, which which I was taught that somehow the Protestant Reformation was about getting back to a an original version of Christianity. Um, when I studied the early church, I found out, you know, the original version of Christianity is pretty much Catholicism. So, you know, um, I want to I want to be the myth buster of the early church. So that's what I do. So come and check me out on YouTube, the original church. And I'm also on Locals. Um, if you want to uh, join a community where we interact more, I'm teaching a Bible study and uh, we have online gatherings and Q&A and all that stuff. That's on locals. It's the original church um, on locals. So uh, you know, come and come and join us. Love to have you. Well, speaking of myth busting, I hope we uh, hope we did the topic tonight justice, and we busted some myths because I know there are people out there who need this information, and I pray that they find it helpful, and I pray that it spreads, and it adds to the ongoing conversation and puts things in the proper context which is key context is king remember that whenever you see somebody quote mining the fathers you gotta you gotta put it in its proper context you gotta get the proper nuances the proper distinctions and ask the right questions to get the right answers simple as that and go to an expert right go to an expert don't just watch youtube videos i mean they're great they have their purpose i'm not an expert right i'm not a scholar but um jim is so 
if I'm not an expert, I defer to the experts because they know, and that's what I'm doing here tonight. So, uh, Brother Jim, I want to thank you so much for your time and for coming on. I'm very excited tomorrow. I have a men's conference with Dr. John Bergsma, so that'll be cool to see him in, per uh, in yeah. person. I've had him on my podcast before a few times. So I got to be up at uh, 4.30 in the morning. So it's a, it's a, I got to, yeah, I got to travel a couple hours. So um, that's good. not morning. That's 4.30 in the middle of the night. That's what oh, that is. That's just crazy. I, I'm going to need a lot of coffee and a lot of prayer. But um, yeah, super excited. I'm glad we did this. We covered everything I wanted to cover. And uh, guys, you've been tuning in to Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise and thy sight is incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was my guest tonight, Dr. Jim Papandrea. Um, and this was episode 90, Idol Worship versus Image slash Relic Veneration. So guys, I hope you benefited. If you did, please subscribe to my channel. Please like the video and please share it to people who need assistance okay because i know there are some folks out there who do there's some confusion and some hullabaloo going on so please share this uh get this out there and support anybody that you see doing a similar thing because this topic is key uh we love our icons we love our images for a reason it's ancient it's patristic it's substance is in the deposit of faith it's not a doctrinal u-turn it's not an innovation and it's not a reversal so i hope that this has been helpful guys with that i'm going to end the broadcast in three, two, one.